This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk, we continue our 36C3 series. In this episode, I speak with Dr. Daniel Kim, founder of Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, a consulting group that is bridging the gap between the cryptocurrency world and the ultra high net worth investor world. Dr. Kim's main focus is on Monero and introducing traditional investors to this new asset. Dr. Kim did a talk at the 36C3 on fiat, Bitcoin, and Monero. I recommend anyone watching this to watch Daniel's 36C3 presentation on the Monero Community YouTube channel. We will add a link to it in the show notes. Dr. Kim gave a detailed presentation on Monero and all its attributes. He ultimately made a very compelling argument for why Monero may be the one crypto everyone should be paying attention to. Dr. Daniel Kim is famously known for coining the phrase, Monero is what Bitcoin noobs think they bought. In my interview with Dr. Kim, we dig into why it is taking so long for the market to realize Monero's obvious value, especially considering its advantages over other cryptos. We also touch upon some of the biggest criticisms of the Monero project. My takeaway is that Monero is poised for adoption among wealthy traditional investors once they begin to understand the true value proposition of cryptocurrency. But because of Monero's true grassroots decentralized nature, it will take time for its roots to spread. The best we can do as a community is to keep building, and one day Monero's value as true digital cash will become undeniable. Monero Talk starts now. All right. We got Dr. Daniel Kim on. Thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, we actually just watched your talk remotely. Uh, it was great and inspiring as usual. Uh, so rather than kind of rehashing the entire talk, I know you, you spoke uh, about scarcity, fungibility, community, uh, correlation. I just wanted to ask kind of a few big questions um, that a lot of people that I hope will be watching this video eventually probably also have. Um, I guess the first one is, given um, all of the you know fundamentals you spoke about in terms of scarcity and the comparison of uh, things like Bitcoin and Monero to gold itself, um, why and, and basically um, all of the attributes that Monero has versus Bitcoin, why aren't we seeing more value uh, being recognized in the market, why isn't the market realizing the value of Monero yet? What, what do you think that that holdup is? Yeah, I think the, um, well, and first it's, um, glad to be on. Um, uh, it's, uh, great to be here at C3. Uh, it's a really interesting vibe. Um, you can, I can see some of the background here. It's like, it's a, uh, like this enormous cavernous room of which the, Monero's cluster has about 5% of the floor space and we're sharing it with uh, other sections of geekdom. And I got the low lights and uh, disco lights and um, lots of people just chilling out. So uh, yeah, it's uh, nice to be here uh, to um, uh, share my, you know, my current thoughts on these uh, crypto projects with uh, European um computer security community. And so as far as adoption goes, yeah, I think I've come up with a, a bit of a mental model of how people get into Monero because, and it's partly on my, like there are a few people now like Diego who uh, who were Bitcoin first, I mean, sorry, Monero first, 
But I mean, I think most of them were Bitcoin people first, and then they found Monero, right? So I think of it kind of like a, like one of those fountains or like one of those chocolate fountains, right? So you have you have uh, like um, like a fountain at the top, and then the top bowl takes time to fill up, and then you know some of the people in the top bowl get wise and they go to the the next bowl down. But there's just there's just this latency behind it. There's like a just like it takes most people several years to go from being, you know, cryptocurrency naysayers to being, you know, rabbit hole uh, denizens of cryptocurrency. I think there might be a similar process that needs to take place um, as people kind of maybe question the ideals that are that are um, assumptions that is that are behind Bitcoin maximalism and really ask themselves, are those assumptions being met? For example, one of them being the um, axiom that any worthwhile technical innovation that a competing coin comes up with will automatically just get sucked into Bitcoin. And therefore it's um, like the, the other coins are nothing but test nets for the best ideas, all, all of which get wrapped into Bitcoin. And somehow I think that that chain of thought somehow for some people gets corrupted into being definitional. In other words, if it's in Bitcoin, it's the best. And if it's not in Bitcoin, it's not the best because by definition, everything that's the best gets sucked into Bitcoin. Therefore, if it's not in Bitcoin, it's second rate. And you can do that way. Maybe you can get away with that line of thinking made for a lot of things. But I think it, it fungibility is one thing that you, you can't really, it doesn't really fly. So yeah, I think basically that's the, that's how I, I don't know, come to peace with the way the market's inefficient. Um, it's that, you know, people, it takes time for these ideas to kind of brew in people's heads. Do you think that will there, that there is going to be like events that kind of trigger the next uh, stage of understanding, or what what's going to take us there? Is it just time and, and education of the market, or do you think there will be kind of triggering I events? I think so. I can't really think of a triggering event besides the you know besides the um, like investment crowd randomly deciding that it's time to get into Monero, something like that. But that you know, who knows? It might never happen. It might happen the opposite direction. Uh, I think you know, Monero has always been a grassroots project about word of mouth, about you know, just um, people sharing ideas with each other, and it grows slowly. I guess like real grass, like real lawns grow slowly, right? They spread um, like at a much slower pace than one might. Hope for, I suppose. If you're looking for your entire one acre backyard to be filled up like yesterday, right? But I don't know. I guess that's probably how I see it happening just because everything else in this project is so, uh, organic and like, um, unforced. How about those people that say, um, that Monero essentially will never be able to overcome Bitcoin's network effect. So not even that Monero will have to one day become larger than Bitcoin, but the fact that Bitcoin is just such a large beast that there won't be enough oxygen in the in the room left for Monero. Yeah, I, I don't know if I buy that either. I mean, there are numerous examples in technology of the first instantiation not being the ultimate one, right? Like there's, um, you know, Facebook versus MySpace or uh, you know, um, DVDs versus Blu-ray. Like there are numerous, numerous examples in which, you know, what what used to be the thing that everybody wanted, just in a few short years, becomes not the thing. It becomes the old thing. I, you know, I guess the difference here is that we're talking about forms of money, and that. That might have a slowing effect in any flippening in that because it's money, 
um, you're unfortunately going to have these base emotions of taking over for people who are invested in like the, the current dominant player. So like, for example, you never had, uh, like in the format war of VHS versus Betamax, you didn't have like a whole bunch of people whose like, um, dreams of early retirement hinged on VHS continuing to outsell beta. And now you do in cryptocurrency. So that might, you know, slow things down because now you'll have a, like the social mass of people who are kind of biased. Um, but in the end, you know, in technology, you have to believe that merit is relevant. Um, I suppose there are examples of inferior technologies that ended up taking hold uh, because um, of first mover advantage. But um, yeah, I think another aspect of this is that there can be different constituencies within people interested in cryptocurrency. So, um, for example, one one theme that I'm trying to posit to the Monero community is that there there might be such a thing as a community investor whose behavior and ethics are closely aligned enough with the community that they, they should be kind of welcomed as part of the group. And so um, I uh, am also unsure of, of the commonly spouted wisdom that mass adoption is a prerequisite for cryptocurrency. I actually think that it might be a specialized enough niche that um, it might just be kind of an elite that that get into this stuff and understand it. Um, the thing is that even among the elite, uh, adoption is low. So if you think of increasing word of mouth and organic adoption among the small subset of the population with the uh, um, I guess the, the combination of plastic intelligence and also openness to new ideas and uh, sort of reluctance to indulge in base um, inclinations that we all have towards, say, like tribalism or um, greed, um, then, you know, we might have a shot, even, even with just that small segment of the population. So, so I guess I, I guess I would, what I mean to say is that the whole premise of like, who's number one, I, I mean, I get it. Like, I get that it's important, like who, which, which project has the largest network effect. But I think along with, uh, um, I guess if one accepts that there will not necessarily be one coin to rule them all. It sort of liberates one from worrying too much about the flipping in, like it, when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, so, I mean, obviously, obviously you get these things. I get these things. Um, how about among, among your clients? Uh, so you, you do, you do run an investment firm. You used to be the head of research at, uh, at a hedge fund. Uh, so your, your circles are among, uh, I think it's fair to say wealthy people that are concerned about uh, their money and are trying to make good investments. Are they beginning to understand the value proposition of Monero? Uh, yeah, I, I would say. But just like all the grassroots stuff, it's slow, right? It's like it, it's a there's like a long process between first hearing about this cryptocurrency stuff and being curious or dismissive and then, you know, being curious about more of the details about how it works. Even from that, it's, it's still a long way to making an allocation, uh, as the, you know, terminology would be meaning to make a investment in, in this, um, prospective idea that you've been kicking around for a while. Um, and it's complicated by the fact that the, all of the apparatus that is needed to acquire cryptocurrency is still completely foreign to the traditional investor. So there's, there's that barrier as well. 
I'm not sure what the answer is though, because when, you know, all these ideas of, um, known names in the traditional finance space getting into cryptocurrency. I'm not necessarily sure that that's the answer either, because really, um, for example, if you hire, you know, big finance company X to custody Bitcoin for you, right? Then as a institutional manager, you're relieved because you have somebody to sue if somebody, something goes wrong. But yet at the other, on the other hand, you're not you're not really participating in the investment, if that makes sense. It's kind of like owning stock, but not voting your shares, which is your right as a shareholder. You know what I'm saying? It's like um, being being a sort of passive in the investment in a way that could actually be detrimental financially. Because, um, like, for example, one thing I have my clients do is run their own node, um, like take the time to set up the, you know, like for Monero, the CLI, uh, the, the command line client, you know, all old school stuff. No, none of the point and click stuff, just like really like, you know, nerd level stuff. And it's, it's a journey, but in the end, it's a form of due diligence, really like running, actually running and getting your hands dirty and understanding this stuff to a deeper level than just saying, you know, here, counterparty, go buy this crypto for me, you know, and hold it until I tell you to sell it. You know, there, there is, in a way, it's a relief to those in traditional finance who are used to dealing with buying stocks and traditional finance, you know, traditional vehicles that way. But at the same time, if you just graft that onto cryptocurrency, it's, um, in a way, an inferior way to become invested. Like, I think I, I try to convince clients of the value of, of taking an, like a sort of OG mentality to the entire asset class, which, which means embracing all of the mechanics of, of ownership and not just waiting for somebody to take care of all the geeky details for you. See, so that, but that, you know, to your point, it's, it just, uh, it, makes the runway even longer, right? Because with with a population like we have here at, at C3 or at DEF CON, generally the people are, you know, technically agile enough to pick stuff up on their own once pointed in the right direction. What would you say that the greatest fear or hesitation actually is for these investors? Is it uh, regulation risk? Is it just the risk that this may not be adopted? What, what would you say their greatest hesitation is with kind of stepping into the pond? Um, I would say it's uh, behavioral. I mean, I would say it's the fear of being shown to be a fool in the future, which actually explains a lot of herd behavior in investing generally. Um, like, you know, the, the old saying, you can't get fired for buying IBM. Like back, back in the uh, 50s or whatever, when IBM was like the hot stock, it was like the Amazon of today. So, you know, as a portfolio manager, if you bought IBM and it went down, well, you know, what, what could you do is IBM, it's like the, the big fish in the pond, but, you know, stake your reputation on some little unknown thing and it goes south, then, you know, it's um, like the social slash career pain is, is greater. So for institutional investors, I would say that is the largest, like that, that kind of personal career fear trumps all the other stuff. You know? And, and that, that sense, that sense of fear gets triggered even more when the steps that one is being asked to do to engage with this new asset class seem so wacky, right? So for example, in, in my talk, I talked about the fact that um, you know, we say that Bitcoin and Monero are permissionless, meaning that there's no application form to fill out to become uh, an account holder in either of these cryptocurrencies. All you really do is you pick a number, uh, and that that number gets used. Like there's there's a bunch of geeky detail behind that. It's that that random number that you pick gets multiplied by the base point of the elliptic curve that your crypto is based on. And so n times the base point gives you another curve point, 
And that, that number N that you picked is the private key and the, the curve point that results is the public key. Like there's, a, there's all this like actual stuff behind it. But if you just boil it down to the simple thing that you could understand, which is, you know, instead of filling out a 10 page form to open your account, we're just going to have you sit at this computer, which is going to pick a random number for you. And that's going to be your account. You know, like every step like that, that just seems wacky and out of left field and quite possibly fake and scammy to somebody whose entire mindset is firmly entrenched in that traditional investing mindset. Every additional wacky thing like that triggers that career feel of fear even more, right? So I think in the end, it's really, it's a different set of fears than those of us within the crypto circles are used to fearing. That makes that makes a lot of sense, actually. It, it, it's it's basically more that more the fear that like all of these crypto guys are totally nuts and stupid and and uh, being fooled. And if I if I listen to these guys and it blows up, then goodbye goodbye uh, portfolio manager, right? Makes a lot of sense. You talked a lot about uh, scarcity. Um, yeah. And you also talked about security, how that relates. Monero has a tail emission, which basically ensures the security of the blockchain in the future uh, because miners will always have an incentive to mine. Whereas in Bitcoin, uh, it's unknown what the future will look like in terms of securing the network with miners because there won't always be that block reward. Uh, but what do you say to people who say, uh, well, the, the tail emission um, destroys the economics of, of, of Monero scarcity or crypto scarcity. Yeah. I think this is an example of, um, kind of absolutist thinking. So, um, it's undeniable that in Bitcoin, the, the, uh, the fact that you can say there's only ever going to be 21 million is easy enough for a five-year-old to understand. And because it's so easy to understand it, it sort of gets, taken to be like this bright line in the sand, right? Um, but if you, you know, just first year macroeconomics, like anyone who studies the macroeconomics of money supplies uh, will, like, you will find that the variable of relevance in any sort of macroeconomic analysis is the inflation rate, right? So it's the interest rate, it's expressed in percent per year. Uh, that is the relevant macroeconomic quantity. And um, so the very clever thing about the Monero linear tail emission is that when you have a linear emission, uh, the percentage of uh, monetary expansion goes asymptotically towards zero. Right? It goes towards zero percent. It never hits zero percent because in any given year, a fixed amount of Monero is going to get generated, but the size of that fixed amount of Monero that gets generated in any one year relative to the base of Monero that's already been generated, that proportion shrinks. So the in inflation rate goes down ever towards zero percent. And that is the relevant quantity in macroeconomics. It's basically zero. It's identical to Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, they can say our inflation rate is equal to zero. But in Monero, we say it's asymptotically 0% per year. Like from a macroeconomic point of view, they're identical. Like if you talk to any, like, you know, like uh, anyone who works at like a Federal Reserve Bank or has experience in that realm, like a half percent inflation is considered noise, right? Because all of these variables that they're measuring at a, at a national level uh, are simply not knowable to, to more precision than like half a percent. Which is why you always see like these um, economic reports getting revised one or two quarters later. They, they're always messing with the numbers because it takes time for all this data to to aggregate up to a, a national level, and so you have these error bars that are larger than Monero's in, entire inflation. And yet, this gets kind of misspun as being "quote unquote" infinite supply, as if. Um, linear inflation of the monetary supply is equivalent to exponential. 
It's not uh, because in ex- if you have exponential growth, in other words, a fixed percent per year of monetary growth, you always end up having this hockey stick sort of uh, curve which grows out of control. Like it doesn't matter if you're at half a percent per year, one percent per year, five percent per year, one one hundredth of a percent per year. Anytime you have that percent per year formulation, by definition, mathematically, that's an exponential growth curve. It might be a slow growth curve, but it's still an exponential growth curve that will eventually grow out of control. In in Monero's tail emission, which is linear, you have the very steady controlled growth that allows for pain of the miners in perpetuity while making the macroeconomic variable of interest, namely the percentage uh, growth rate per year, asymptotically zero. So equivalent to Bitcoin. So like that, that whole narrative of the tail emission destroys the goodness of um, scarcity is it's it's um, it's kind of the worst kind of fun because it sounds plausible. It, it, it's superficially true, but almost intentionally misleading because it's it's irrelevant. Yeah, I find it kind of. Uh, um to be you know a uh, uh, hypocrisy as well because uh in in bitcoin land the argument also always is well we're most concerned about security so if if the if the main concern is security then uh why aren't they thinking about the future of the of the blockchain and how it's going to be mined why is security no longer matter uh when we well, look at the, I think it the goes, of the it goes to what I was saying before about um, this tendency within Bitcoin maximalists to, to make things definitional, right? So whatever the current state of Bitcoin is, is the best. And so this, this usage of the word security to be a glorified synonym for hash power, because that's really what they need, is they're bragging that their hash power is the biggest. And then they equate hash power with the much broader term of security, right? And then make a claim that, um, you know, the security is number one. It's really a more narrow definition of security. Right. So, but yeah, the future kind of, security is, is unknown because we don't know what's going to happen as Bitcoin tends towards z- a, a zero in terms of its emission. We don't know how it's going to be secured by miners. Right, right. But we're using security in a broader sense. And when the when the Bitcoin ma- maximalists are saying we we care about security, they really are thinking hash power, because that's the narrow definition of security that they're using. Because that's what, that's the one in which Bitcoin is undisputably kind of you know the king, and so they cling to that narrow definition of security when saying the word security. How about those that would respond to you and in in when you're talking about Monero's tail emission essentially tending towards zero in terms of percentage of supply, um, that that's then just kind of kicking the can down the road and Monero will eventually have the same problem as Bitcoin in terms of securing the chain with miners if that emission is effectively tending towards zero in terms of uh, percentage of supply. Um. Well, the thing is, see, like, there's a linear view and an, and an exponential view. In the exponential view, uh, Monero's inflation rate is tending towards zero. But in the linear view, every year there's like a guaranteed chunk of funds that is going to miners, right? So this is kind of like, it's, it's possible to kind of fight dirty in your semantic argument by like switching from one to the other, right? So this is, I would say, an example of that. This is saying, oh, well, look, you're saying that the annual inflation is asymptotically going to 0%. Therefore, there's no money going to the miners. Well, no, you, you need to switch to the appropriate view, which is the linear view, which is saying there's a chunk of money that goes to the miners every year. Now, you could argue maybe it won't be enough to incentivize them properly, but that's a very different problem to have than oh, there's going to be zero and we need to manufacture a fee market to, to, to like make up for that, right? Because arguably this um, premature 
optimization of the free market problem was uh, arguably responsible for the Bitcoin divorce, right? Basically, people saying, oh, in 100 years, the subsidy is going to go to zero. So people better get used to this idea of, you know, bidding up uh, their, their fees that they pay for transactions because, you know, they don't deserve any space on the block. Like this whole narrative gets built to try and condi- like, like to put the burden of, of the problem squarely on the transactors, right? Um, and so then you had a group of transactors who took issue with that, and that led to, you know, the divorce of Bitcoin. So, and arguably it was um, what uh, Donald knew, uh, one of the kind of like, uh, like um, pioneers of computing, uh, the, the inventor of LaTeX, the typesetting software, also open source. But it's his uh, famous quote that uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. So that is, you know, you identify this problem and then you optimize for it before you need to. Uh, nothing good comes of that. And I would argue that this whole um, preparing for what's going to happen 100 years down the road in Bitcoin where there being zero subsidy is an example of that. But again, it's, it's a problem that Monero is never going to have because none of us are freaking out about what's going to happen in 100 years because we have this linear emission, which, again, provides for um, at least a guaranteed chunk of money to go to miners um, while keeping the macroeconomic variable of interest, namely the annual inflation rate asymptotically zero. So the you know the future problem that Monero has, if it has it, it's going to be much much less of an assault on the um, social contracts. Like in Monero, it might be oh should the tail emission be 0.8 Monero per block instead of 0.6? There might be that debate, but it's not going to be like fundamentally like oh the users are going to have to get used to paying for the minor security. Right. It's, it's not going to be like this like this kind of um, like like crude uh, assignment of the burden of a problem to one group within the ecosystem. It's not going to be like that. Right. Yeah. Monero potentially has the option to adjust that tail emission in the future, given that the kind of uh, it's the, the cat's out of the bag with it. Uh, the community is okay with the concept. Uh, whereas in Bitcoin, uh, the 21 million cap is something that's been promised to the community. Oh, it's sacred. Right. Yeah, right. And so, also, you know, the, the kind of irrational allergy to hard forks works in Monero's favor too, because that, then we actually can have a sane and rational and calm discussion, uh, you know, in 50 years from now about increasing the subsidy to 0.8 or 0.7 or whatever, whatever the, um, you know, um, smart community Hopefully it'll still be super smart in 50 years comes up with and they're, you know, yeah, I, I see it leading to just much less drama in Monero as, as with everything, much less drama. Uh, one, one guy in the audience, I think asked you if you had any criticisms of Monero and uh, I, I think offhand you couldn't think, well, I think basically you said that the community may be too pure. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if, if I know if I had to uh, really kind of give an honest uh, critique, I think one of the ones that comes up is the audibility of, of, of Monero and the ability to guarantee uh, that there's no hidden inflation going on. I know we've done shows on this where we've kind of uh, explained that that really, at the end of the day, may be FUD, but does Bitcoin win in, in that area? And is that, is that a fundamental problem for Monero? I, I think it is a fundamental engineering trade-off that has to be made. Like, basically, do you want it to be auditable by a five-year-old? And does it really bother you if it requires um, college-level math or even a bit higher to convince yourself of the soundness of the um, that each transaction is not uh, inadvertently or you know mistakenly allowing funds to be created out of thin air, which is the the, the concern. 
I guess a few points I, a few ideas I have on that is, um, one, usually the people who complain the loudest on that, I don't see them doing the research themselves to, like, even see if they can convince themselves that a more sophisticated, um, a more, you know, sophisticated slash complex method of guaranteeing soundness can work. You know, it's like, again, like the line has been drawn at five-year-old must be able to audit. And then there's like this refusal to budge. Like anything other than that is just like, it kind of, it's outside the Overton window for them. You know what I mean? It's like they're unwilling to even consider it. I have yet to meet one of these complaining people who actually could delve into like some in-depth um, like knowledge of how bulletproofs actually work, for example. Right? It's like they, they'd rather not do the work, and they 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 don't want to do they don't want to do the work, and they they're kind of offended by the idea that someone should have to do the work. Um, but in the end. Uh, what are we gaining on a broader level in Monero by having this? Like, what does Ring CT? What is what's the what's the benefit that we're getting for this um, like potential for a uh, bug, right? For example, and it is the avoidance of a creepy surveillance state. You know, it's it's kind of like pick your poison. Like, it's one thing to just say, oh. I don't like that uh, a five-year-old can't audit Monero. Like, it's one thing to say that, but you also need to combine that with, uh, like, the trade-off. Like, it, the, the, the complete honest statement would be, it, for me, a five-year-old needs to be able to audit the blockchain, and if that's what it takes, I am okay with a, uh, you know, Orwellian surveillance state being built around that fact that a five-year-old can audit everything that happens on the chain. And I'm okay with that. Like that needs to be the complete statement, but you don't hear that. You, you just hear, oh, well, we have a superior, um, you know, we have a superior transparent, like uh, we have a superior ability to make sure that nothing funny is happening with the blockchain while conveniently ignoring the rest. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point. I mean, it's uh, it's just another level of abstraction on top of what Bitcoin was. So I could see it being a necessity on day one when you're when you're introducing cryptocurrency to the world, uh, just being able to trust the basic concept so you could very easily look under the hood. Uh, but it's kind of like, you know, once you understand how a combustion engine works, you don't need to always see it in your face. Um, so I, Monero is kind of the next level of abstraction, letting, allowing us to do greater things with now the, the understanding that we, we trust the basic concepts and math and cryptography underlying cryptocurrency. I guess, uh, one, one last question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you, if you, if you want to answer this, uh, it's kind of it's antithetical to the Monero community in many ways. But where do you see Monero in the next five to ten years in terms of in terms of price? Oh boy, um, yeah, I, I don't think I want to go there. Okay, there. Are How about in terms of, in terms of adoption, um, in terms of where we're at uh, ecosystem wise? Hmm. Yeah, that's hard too, because I think there's um, like this retail level grassroots stuff that's happening, but it's hard for, it's hard to, you know, it's hard for nuanced uh, technical discussion and sort of reasoned discussion like that on a person to person level to compete with, you know, Oh wow, this project just raised a billion dollars. You know, let me get a piece of that. It's hard to compete with that. I don't know what to say to that except just that um, I don't know. Like, it's it's like another version of you only live once. It's like uh, it's like some people tend to mean that in in that you should go for speculative investments, right? Because you only live once, but. There's another aspect to that, and that is because you only live once, you want to 
put your effort behind um, the most meritorious project that's going to like do the best for humanity. So, you know, I guess if, if that sort of mentality continues to grow, I guess I see some small indications that it might be, you know, like, like, for example, it's amazing to me that there have been so many Monero conferences this year. Um, and I guess I include, I, I use a somewhat loose definition of that because there was not only the conference, of which was the first truly bona fide, like true Monero conference, although, although that slight, slightly all the meetups that happened before that were sort of informal conferences, right? But, um, yeah, but like DEF CON, C3, uh, yeah, there's never been more opportunity for, uh, people to get involved with this community. And so hopefully there'll be just a lot more people getting in there. Like that, that's one of the fun things about Monero, I think, is that, uh, it dawned upon me also what, like Fluffy had said, which is, like nobody has to ask for permission in this community. It's like, you, like it's true open source. It's like you see a problem in the code, you fix it. Yeah. You know? And you, then you have the satisfaction of, of knowing that you identified uh, somewhere you, where you could personally help and did it. It's kind of a nice feeling. And so, um, I think the same applies to, you know, like outreach to use for lack of a better term, it's like, you know, it's like there's nobody that needs permission to go share their um, insights with other people. So I, I hope it continues to spread. Um, it would be nice if that were sort of exponential, right? Like that sort of spreading. But it probably is exponential, but just like at a very small constant. So like you're saying, it's... Uh, it can be frustrating for those of us who um, had had the insights we've had into the merits of this project, but I don't know what else can we do. Yeah, Keep yeah, yeah, chugging along. I mean, I'm personally ignoring price and the, the the bear market overall. I'm I'm personally more bullish than ever ever in terms of seeing where Monero is at, uh, its growth in the ecosystem, the progress it's it's making. Yeah. And actually, part of me kind of hopes that the crypto winter even continues. I mean, you know, it's like it hasn't shaken out enough of these like idiotic projects. Like there, there, there's still so many of these like dumb ideas that are like way up there on the market cap. And somehow crypto winter hasn't killed them. So I don't know. I'm, I'm of mixed opinions about it. You know? but, but who knows what will happen? Yep. Well, yeah, a great opportunity to get in the market as well, right? Is it's the way I always uh, explain it to people. So uh, I think certainly I th better than two Christmases ago. Exactly. So yeah. uh, I, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much. Like I, uh, to anybody that's that's watching this, I highly urge you to uh, watch Dr. Daniel Kim's talk that he did previous to this. So that's you can find that. Um, it's, if you Google 36 C3, Dr. Daniel Kim, I'm sure you'll, you'll find that talk, the full talk. Um, thanks again. Thank you for coming on. Always a pleasure having you. Is there anything else you want to leave off with? Um, no, not really. Hope you have a good one. All right. Yeah. Enjoy the uh, conference. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. What, what is the overall mood there? What is the, uh, the feel of the conference? Uh, it's like, like, a um, it's kind of festive, but also chill. So there's like a lot of lounging around, a lot of just hanging out, I guess. Um, yeah, it's, it's different from DEF CON. Maybe um, possibly with the new like gigantic space that's getting, getting built uh, with Caesars Forum, it might feel a bit more like this does now. Like if there's like a giant open space and people are free to just kind of roam around a bit more than... Um, like being um, like rats in a casino maze. Uh, so yeah, we'll see. But yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's uh it's different. Some things are common, like the uh, like the rush for tickets. Oh, the ticket situation here is much more difficult. So um, that's 
but it's nice that they don't run out of badges, at least in recent years in DEF CON. Seems to be much more of a problem here. Um, but uh, thanks, Fluffy, for the uh, for giving me your extra badge. <laughs> oh, wow. Very nice of him. Yeah. yeah. All right. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hope to talk to you in the future. Yep. Have a good one. See ya. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.